Electricity feels simple, but the kind of current we use may be a leftover choice. Your wall outlet delivers alternating current, flipping direction 50 or 60 times each second. Yet your phone, laptop, LED lights, solar panels, and every battery you own prefer direct current, a steady one-way flow. So are we feeding modern life the wrong shape of power? If we moved more of our world to DC, would energy get cheaper, cleaner, and easier to store? Today, we trace an old rivalry, the hidden DC inside gadgets, and the quiet comeback reshaping parts of the grid right now. The DC dream and the sponsor detour. The idea sounds almost too neat. Put solar panels on the roof, store that power in a home battery, and charge an electric car in the driveway. In that vision, the key parts run on direct current, not alternating current. DC is what a solar panel makes. DC is what a battery stores. DC is what an EV battery wants. So it is fair to ask if our grid is speaking the wrong dialect. Before we dig in, a quick detour. I recently read an extra thick special issue of The Economist about the world ahead in 2026. It jumps from economics to science, politics, technology, and global affairs, and it does it in plain language that moves fast. You can get it in print or read it in an app. There are also subscriber podcasts, editor discussions on video, and audio versions if you prefer listening while you travel or work. I like it because it helps connect small inventions to big consequences. If you want to try it, there is a discount through my link. Now, back to currents, because the shape of electricity may decide how smooth the energy transition feels. And yes, this topic is also about money. Every extra box, adapter, and inverter is a cost. Every watt lost as heat is a bill you pay. So even small efficiency gains matter when they repeat across millions of homes and devices. Why AC1 in the first place? More than a century ago, electricity had a public showdown. Thomas Edison backed direct current. Nikola Tesla backed alternating current. In simple terms, DC flows one way, while AC changes direction over and over. Tesla's camp argued AC could be safer in some situations, but the real reason AC spread was money. Power lines lose energy as heat. To cut those losses, you raise the voltage, because high voltage lets you send the same power with less current. The problem back then was how to change the voltage. With the transformers of that era, AC could be stepped up for transmission and stepped down for homes with good efficiency and at low cost. Doing the same trick with DC was harder and wasteful. So utilities built a world around AC and it scaled. That is why your outlet delivers a wave that flips polarity 50 or 60 times a second, depending on where you live. Once that network existed, every new building and appliance was designed to match it. The grid became a huge machine with momentum. Even if a better option appeared later, replacing everything at once would be painful. So the early engineering advantage turned into a long-lasting lock-in. AC also fit the machines of the time. Early factories used large AC motors, and the standards for plugs, meters, and protection gear grew around that choice. Once standards harden, they are hard to unfreeze. The hidden DC inside almost everything here is the ironic part. Even in an AC world, most modern devices are secretly DC machines. Your phone charges on DC. A laptop runs on DC. LED bulbs, Wi-Fi routers, televisions, and game consoles all rely on DC inside. They only accept AC at the wall because the grid gives them no choice. That is why we have chargers, power bricks, and internal power supplies. They convert the incoming AC to DC and then regulate it into neat, steady voltages that electronics can handle. The list of devices that truly do not care is shorter. It is mostly gear that uses electricity to make heat, such as ovens, kettles, and toasters, though even those can be built to run from DC. This shift is big enough that European grid operators have estimated that by 2030, a large share of household demand could come from DC-powered devices. Industry leans the same way. Most IT equipment runs internally on DC. The semiconductor world uses a lot of DC. Telecom systems do too. So when people say, we use AC, what they often mean is, we convert AC into DC everywhere, all day. That conversion works, but it is not free. 
Each step adds heat losses, extra parts, and more things that can fail. In a typical home, that conversion happens many times. A phone brick may waste only a little, but add game consoles, TVs, modem boxes, and chargers for tools, and the trickle becomes a stream. The same is true in offices, where every desk is a cluster of DC loads. DC on the big grid. At first glance, this seems to prove we should rip out AC and replace it with DC. But the story is more nuanced. Both AC and DC transmit well at very high voltage. The real difference is in the equipment at the ends of the line. Modern power electronics have changed what is practical. High voltage DC, often called HVDC, uses converter stations that turn AC into DC for the long run and then back again at the destination. Those stations are expensive, but the lines can be efficient, controllable, and useful for very long distances or undersea cables. That is why China built huge HVDC links from renewable rich western regions to the crowded east. India has added similar projects. Europe now uses multiple HVDC connections between countries, helping balance supply and demand across borders. In the United States, there has been a major HVDC link on the West Coast since the 1970s, and interest has grown again in recent years. Governments have offered support for new projects, and analysts expect the HVDC market to keep expanding. Still, big lines are not the main reason DC feels like it is returning. The bigger story is happening much closer to where we plug things in. Another benefit is control. HVDC can push power precisely where you want it, and it can connect regions that run on different AC frequencies or are not synchronized. That flexibility matters when wind and solar outputs swing hour to hour. Microgrids, where the comeback becomes real. The word you will hear more and more is microgrid. Think of a microgrid as a small local power network designed for a building, a factory, a data center, or even a whole district. In many of these places, loads are mostly electronic and power sources may include rooftop solar and battery storage. If you distribute DC inside that boundary, you can avoid some conversions and simplify parts of the system. A nice example appeared in 2023 in the Netherlands, where a commercial district built a DC microgrid so street lights, shops, and EV chargers could run directly on DC. In the United States, the Living Energy Farm in Virginia has operated on a solar-powered DC microgrid since 2017, supplying homes and workshops without the usual AC backbone. Projects like these push manufacturers to build the missing pieces. DC breakers, DC meters, safer connectors, and smart converters that move between voltages without wasting much energy. This is also why data centers care. A data center is basically a cathedral of DC. Servers and storage run on DC, yet they often take AC, convert it, and then convert again inside racks. If you start fresh, a DC layout can cut steps, cut heat, and make backup batteries integrate more cleanly. There is also a practical angle. Many DC microgrids use several voltage levels at once, like a high bus for big loads and a lower bus for lighting and electronics. Good converters let you move between them smoothly, like gears in a bike. Do the numbers justify a switch? Efficiency claims can get fuzzy, so it helps to look at real tests. Purdue University retrofitted an actual house from the 1920s to run mostly on direct current. They paired solar panels with battery storage, used DC-friendly controls, and even ran a heat pump on DC. Their early results suggested that electricity use for heating and cooling dropped by about 12 to 17 percent. That sounds great, but it is not automatic for every home. Many studies put typical whole home savings in a wide range, roughly 2 to 15 percent, and the high end usually needs the full package of solar, batteries, and EV charging. For an existing house, the cost of rewiring and replacing equipment can eat those gains for years. That is why the best targets are new buildings, new factories, and new campuses, where you can design for DC from day one. So are we using the wrong electricity? Not really. We are using a system that was optimal for its time, but we are also building a new layer on top of it. Expect more hybrid designs, AC for legacy grids, HVDC for certain long links, and local DC microgrids where they offer clear benefits. 
It is not a revolution. It is a quiet efficiency upgrade, a micro revolution that Edison would probably enjoy. If you already have solar and a battery, you are closer to DC than you think. The inverter that makes AC for the house is often the main loss point. Some future systems may keep more power in DC form inside the home and only convert when necessary. So no, we are not using wrong electricity so much as we are using yesterday's default. AC still moves power well, especially across old networks built for it. But the future is full of DC sources and DC loads, and every unnecessary conversion leaks a little energy and adds hardware. Expect a hybrid world, long distance lines where DC makes sense, and local DC microgrids in places packed with solar, batteries, and electronics. If Edison were here, he would smile. If Tesla were here, he would shrug and point to efficiency. Either way, the goal is simpler power, not nostalgia.